Hello, my name is Dr. Freddy Garcia. Today we're joined by Dr. Professor Carrick, and we're doing another clinical research update. How are you doing today, Professor Carrick? I'm doing fine. Good to see you, Freddy. Well, thank you for taking the time to speak with, uh, uh, speak with us today. Uh, professor Carrick, you are a full professor of neurology at the University of Central Florida uh, College of Medicine. You're also a full professor for the adjunct faculty at Mass General Institute and a full professor of neurology and senior research fellow at the Center for Mental Health Research in association with the University of Cambridge in Cambridge uh, in the United Kingdom. You are also a global clinical scholar at the Harvard Medical School and the Dean of Graduate Studies uh, here at the Carrick Institute. Uh, today, I'm excited to talk to you about your latest research. Gosh, you're putting out so many papers. This is incredible. Uh, you and your team have discovered a new technology to accelerate wound healing uh, and the United States Department of Defense has taken notice, which is absolutely incredible. Uh, your findings have been accepted by the scientific jury to be presented at the Military Health System Research Symposium, scheduled to be held live in Kissimmee, Florida on August 23rd through 26th of this year. And they shall be published as soon as the embargo on the research has been lifted. So we'll, we'll, we'll probably put this video out along with that. Uh, this is a huge meeting attended by several thousand delegates, and it's incredible that your research is going to be featured in it, so congratulations. Thank you. The Military Health System Research Symposium is the USA Department of Defense premier scientific meeting that, focus, that focuses specifically on the unique medical needs uh, of the warfighter. Uh, your team studied wound healing in a mouse model that uh, simulated the wounds that are suffered in combat situations. And you found a way to make wounds heal significantly faster, which is, is obviously, I totally get why they're, they're looking into that. So let me go right into the first question. Are you ready, Professor? Yes. All right. So in your research, you described a, di a diabetic patient, actually, that was scheduled to have a limb amputated because of impaired wound healing. For those who, who, who know diabetes, you know this, this comes with the territory. So you demonstrated an incredible reversal of pathology of several, month, uh, of several months in just a week, which is amazing. And I know that you have a lot of global attention to your research uh, contribution to diabetes. And I know, that I've, I know of at least three high-tiered peer-reviewed papers that you have published in the Journal of Diabetes Research and Clinical Practice. That, that journal has a 5.602 impact factor, as well as Frontiers Endocrinology that has a 5.555 and also the Journal of Neonatal and uh, Perinatal Medicine. Did your published uh, work in diabetes increase your awareness of wound care? Did that like kind of segue into having you study this? It, it really did. And exciting is that uh, from two aspects, when you read our, our work in diabetes, uh, we have got some amazing changes that we do for diabetic patients that are independent of the drug treatments and things that, that people do. That's something that we can spend some time just talking about, but it gave us a lot of uh, global attention uh, to our work. Uh, it's published in high tiered activity, pre predominantly looking at uh, depression and diabetes, but as a consequence with the large numbers of patients that we saw clinically, uh, we saw a lot of wounds that weren't healing. Uh, we also would see patients that would come in with head trauma that would have diabetes and that would complicate things or concussions. And uh, oftentimes they would have wounds or they'd have other uh, comorbidities that we would have to take care of uh, at the same time. So when we look at wounds and everyone, regardless of our discipline, sees wounds every day, whether you sprain a ligament or so the wounds are internal or if they're external, such as in our recent study. But the, the basic aspect is that wounds have a range, and uh, that range can be very simple uh, damage or disruption to an anatomical structure or to anatomical function. And we are the functional people, certainly in, in neurology. So the costs associated with wounds are among the highest in, in medicine. It has a severe impact on the well-being of individuals and uh, society. So the one thing for sure is that uh, diabetics uh, have problems with wound healing. And we have got more large wounds today than we've ever had, where people, especially in the military, will suffer from these large surface wounds, uh, maybe with amputations of legs or 
you know, in their, in their gut or their head. So war fighters uh, are such that when a wound doesn't heal well, then it has a greater probability of infection, uh, suffering, pain, disability, uh, depression, on and on and on. So at the end of the day, faster healing of wounds can decrease pain and suffering and save lives. So uh, the answer is yes. And when we saw what this technology could do with diabetic wound healing, we realized that we needed to investigate what was the mechanism, how does it work, and we needed to develop an animal model to, to test this novel therapy. And that's exactly what we did. Awesome. Um, I'm going to... I'm going to come back. We're going to come back to the study, but I do want to ask you, and I keep forgetting to do this. Can, because you are involved with UCF College of Medicine, can you tell us very briefly what is, uh, what's the overview of the research that you're doing at the UCF College of Medicine? Well, I've been very, very busy uh, there for the last few years. And uh, in our lab, we've recently developed a new Alzheimer's therapy and uh, looking at a combination of different uh, medicines that will affect stem cells and increase the development of brain cells and improve brain function. We're really excited about that. We're also the first group in the world to transplant the stem cells isolated from the human brain into aged rats that I'm working with. And uh, we showed increased development of new brain cells and improvement of cognition in the animals. And right now we're working on developing a new treatment for glioblastoma multiforme, which is a type of brain cancer, using a gene therapy with a, with a unique delivery system. So my life work has been involved around neurodegenerative diseases, brain injury, and that's what I'm really looking at. And uh, the things that, that we see clinically are patients with Alzheimer's disease, uh, Parkinson's disease, supranuclear palsies, frontal temporal uh, dementias, of course, a TBI that we're known for uh, globally. And so in the lab, we're looking at trying to heal uh, the brain. So we use stem cells uh, very, very actively. And uh, when we look at this, we realize that stem cells that we can utilize in a Parkinson's model can also be used in wound healing. Everything is involved in healing. So we basically took our clinical knowledge uh, the knowledge that I've had over the last 43 years and the information that I learned, you know, at the bench when I did my PhD and into this and to, to look at different applications that a clinician would see and bring that into the lab. So it's coming from the clinical world and bring it into the lab. And so what we found uh, in, in this experiment that got us attention with the military is that we could heal wounds better, we could heal stem cells better after they'd been injured by using a novel application of a far field infrared field. Dr. Kirk, you talked about your experience. You've been doing this for 40, I think 43 years. And again, you, like you said, you're mostly devoted to brain injury and newer, neurodegenerative uh, disorders. Do you feel you're still making progress in your understanding of all these conditions? Yes, it's, it's really like night and day, and uh, treating these conditions has, has been my life's work. And um, every time you feel that you're really on top of the game, you open up a page and see another patient and realize there's so much more to do. So I'm dedicated to, to knowing more. And we had great results, you know, 40 years ago, 30 years ago, 20 years ago, but nothing as good as what I'm doing now and hopefully what people will be doing in the future. So short and sweet, um, we've got right now, my Parkinson model uh, is so exciting. And I'll be talking about that with you once I finish this study, but I know that you're gonna go uh, really, you know, crazy happy about this and as well as with Alzheimer's uh, disease. But we're starting right now on, on wounds and then I'll, talk to you at another time about what we're finding with brain function and looking at an animal model to duplicate what I've seen in, in human patients is a dream come true. We, we've got the technology now that we can make models 
that can simulate what we see in our in our patients. It's very frustrating when you you see a patient, they get better, they don't get better, and you have to hypothesize how it is that it worked or didn't. But now we can see it, and uh, that really tells us we can change the things we do in the clinical practice uh, and make it better. Excellent. So let's get back to uh, the, the top topic again with this research paper. So in this paper, you were talking, or the, re the research itself is about, you know, novel, I could see it above your head here, the novel far infrared uh, ceramic blanket. So I was excited to start trying to understand far field infrared emissions and, uh, and the fact that it was coming from a blanket. But one of the things that kind of intrigued me is that this thing doesn't have a power supply. So there's no batteries, there's no wires. So I was, part of me is going, hold on one second. Like it just couldn't compute for me. So can you explain to me how this thing works? Yeah, it, it really is exciting because as you know, people have lasers and far field things, you plug them in and you know, <laughs> everything whizzes up. Well, this is an autonomous um, uh, system that was, um, we, we took from industry. And basically they're made of ceramics that are embedded in a type of rubber frame. And what happens is, is that these ceramics will actually absorb energy from anything in its vicinity. If it's a cup of coffee, uh, if it's a person, uh, anything that is, you know, anything is in the, in the vicinity itself. So when you look at, at a subject or a person, you have to realize we have all of these cells and all these cells are vibrating at certain frequencies. So if you can imagine these ceramics will sense that vibration and then they will emit another uh, frequency of vibration as a consequence of the vibration that they sense in the individual structure and they will emit it, but the emissions are very deep penetrating. They'll go through you know, walls if you would. And so what we did is we measured the wavelength and the wavelength has a, a lambda of 600 to 1070 uh, nms. Um, just like the black box, we'd never seen anything like this before. So it's true that you look and say, this is crazy. If you just have the, the blank, there's nothing. If you put like a, a hand or something, all of a sudden it starts to to emit these, um, these wavelengths of far field infrared and with no heat. So we had this company build us these mats specifically that we could put in cages of animals so we could irradiate the entire animal and treat them for a variety of different conditions. Interesting. Yeah, I just couldn't wrap my head around the fact because you are right. Like I'm so used to everything being plugged in or battery charge and it powers up and it wears up. So uh, this is interesting, but thank you for the explanation. Um, has anybody done research like this, you know, this type of clinical research before on this type of technology? Has it, has it been done before? Well, no. And that's the exciting thing at, uh, at the College of Medicine here. We're the first people to do it in the world. Uh, there has been use of a non-powered ceramic crystal induced far field infrared activity in industry where they took uh, hydrocarbon fuels. So if you can imagine when you see a smokestack and they're burning things, you see that black uh, smoke that's coming out, they put these crystal, crystal ceramics around there and then it's like electing a new pulp. The smoke comes out white, the pollutants decrease and the efficiency of burning was significantly higher. So it affected some aspect of what we would say clinicians as seem like circulation of the fuel. And, uh, and we knew, of course, uh, through uh, other people's research that this far field infrared activity at that wavelength has been associated with the prevention of tissue necrosis. Uh, that there's been increases of uh, the function of mitochondria, that there's stimulation of uh, healing, increased oxygenation, increased blood flow with that wavelength. It was pretty obvious to us that we said, well, since other people have seen it with some pretty fancy sort of things, can we, can we see it in, uh, in a live model, person or animal, and can we see it 
in, in a test tube. So we developed a, an in vitro and in vivo model where we test a, uh, tested live animals that we created wounds with, as well as stem cells. And we found that in fact it works and it works better than any other generator of these types of wavelengths. Fantastic. So professor, I know that your research, you've done uh, research in many different areas relative to clinical applications, um, but bringing this back down to wounds, what are you, the clinicians that, you, you know, you've trained clinicians all around the world, if you could communicate to those clinicians, what do we need to know about wounds, both big and small? Well, and that's a huge lifetime question, but basically if we can sum it up, here, here's the stats. 70% of all wounds um, have a problem healing. 70%. That wow. means that only 30% of them with all of us are going to heal ideally. 70%. So the cost of wounds are billions of dollars just in this country, but around the world, it is staggering, absolutely staggering. Uh, so when we look at this, there's a significant investment in wound care. Uh, each day longer in a hospital costs more and onwards and onwards and onwards. So we need to understand, first of all, how do wounds heal? If you hurt your back, how does that heal? If you hurt your brain, how does that heal? If you hurt your skin, how does that heal? Well, we understand the cellular and molecular mechanisms of wound healing. And we realize that that's central to our work. We discuss what those mechanisms are in great detail in, in, our, in our research publication. So what we looked at as a problem is if 70% of these wounds don't heal effectively, how can we make them heal better? How can we decrease the time, decrease the suffering, decrease the pain associated with wound healing, and then um, go, you know, go further? So it's always been the case of having uh, in vivo live animal research and human research and in vitro mechanisms. Uh, did we have the skills and technology to simulate this? And the answer is yes. Yes, we did. We also realized that right now, wound healing is a big complication for our war fighters in the military. There's never been such catastrophic uh, wounds with the, the armaments of munitions, the ordnance and explosions and just terrible lesions that people will have. And especially on the field where you may have a great big wound and you may die uh, on that field, whereas if something was self-contained, you didn't have to plug it in, you're in a trench that you could start that wound healing uh, independent or out on your own, or if you're on a, a rafting trip with your buddies or you're, you're, you're down in a different foreign country or you're hiking and something happens to you uh, that without a power supply or anything else, you can start something healing and decrease the morbidity was very, very exciting. And we started postulating you know, how we could do this by putting uh, these, uh, these structures inside a cast, for instance, to promote healing of a limb, to treat burns, to treat, you know, big gashes. Even if you suture close them, uh, a lot of them dehiss. In other words, how can we prevent that? And uh, so we developed a, um, a model. And um, that, that model was very exciting. It took me a long time to do it is very, very labor intensive, if you can imagine, but we were very successful and I'm just so excited about it. And other people are excited about it as well. Fantastic. So Dr. Carrick, when the team here at the Carrick Institute uh, put me in charge of doing these clinical research updates, I was like, all right, this is not gonna be easy because reading papers is, is a, is a, is a skill set that takes concerted effort and I'm trying to get better. But so, but in your research, I'm finding that um, the, that the experimental methodology is complex. Like I literally have to read some of those sections a few times, and that's part of it's because I'm learning, I'm getting better. Can you break it down for everybody at home, uh, but in a summary fashion? Like for this paper, can you make can you explain it so in a way that they'll understand? Yeah, and I think you're pretty humble because you catch on to things pretty darn fast. But I think when most people read a paper. 
they read the abstract and the conclusions and they skip all the stuff in between because it is complicated. That's for sure. But it's where really the jewelry is. So here's what we did. We took um, mice and took them uh, at eight weeks of age. And then um, I did uh, some surgical procedures on them. And we basically take the skin, we shave the back of the mice. So imagine if it was you from your neck down to below your rib cage, and then make surgical wounds through the skin, the fat, and the muscle, just take it right out, two wounds on either side with a big punch. And we had a control group that we put in, you know, cages as normal, and an active group that we put on these individual mats. And then what we did is each day we would measure the wounds. Now, to do this, of course, we had to anesthetize them so they wouldn't hurt. We gave them medication to decrease their pain and suffering. We did things as humanely as possible. And even when we, when we measured the size of the wound and the granulation of the wound, we would anesthetize the animal uh, so that we could do it without causing them any, uh, any discomfort. So when we did this, we saw some amazing things that were just incredible. First of all, the, the animals that were put on the mat within a day started to, the wounds would like be closing in front of our eyes, literally. And if you look at our, the poster uh, behind me, you can see these, these diagrams here, will show the differences between the control group closure and the other. It was absolutely phenomenal. But what was really exciting was how they would socialize these animals it's like, you know, watching the movie Vikings when the people are cutting, you know, the, these big wings out of people. They were just having a, a party. They were active and socializing, you know, and walking around. The, the other animals were not so happy. So uh, they super healed. And the statistically significant, less than 0 .001, uh, there's no doubt that they healed quicker. But what we also found, and if you look at activity and just, you know, right uh, sort of behind me, we've got little pictures that you can see where we um, looked at the, uh, the cross section of the, the wound. So after the animals were healed, we're able to sacrifice the animal, cut out the area of the wound and look at it histologically. Oh my God. So you have to realize that when we do the surgery, we cut a big hole so that all of the, you know, the hair cells are gone. The muscle is gone. The skin is gone. The soft tissue is gone. And what this uh, far-field infrared blanket does is it activates stem cells in bone to travel to the area of the wound and stem cells, you know, can become any cell that the body needs. Lo and behold, we saw hairs growing out of these wounds. And when you look at the histologist, as you've seen with our, uh, with, with our research, these hair cells are boom, they're back, not in the controlled animal. The muscle is back and the vascularization of the muscle is absolutely huge. You can see it, we stained it green. So you go, wow, that's back. And uh, they healed up completely as if they were not wounded before, not so with the other, the other animals. So then what we did is we said, okay, let's look and say, uh, we wanna look at the immunohistochemistry and immunoblotting and find out why this actually occurs. So we know that things that are important in healing are the ability to have uh, stem cells migrate into a wound to promote the healing. We also know that in order to do this, we need to revascularize an area. So if you cut out, you know, the, the arterial bed and the vascular supply, you've got to get new vessels in there. And so we label different markers. Uh, CD31 is a big marker for vascularization. And we measured that with immunohistochemistry and fluorescence so we can make it shine. And we looked at a Western blot and saw it. Well, lo and behold, the, the quantity of uh, CD31 was through the roof in the active group compared to the control group. So we knew we were activating that. We never expected 
that to be so profound. We also found that the fibrinogen levels uh, were increased initially in the active group and at the end of a couple of weeks in the control. And the fibrinogen is that key component in the, in the wound uh, matrix that looks at cell adhesion and migration, and cellular signaling, chemotaxis and things. And so that happened very, very early. We were like floored and uh, it was there. So then what we did, Freddie's, which I, I think was really exciting. So, okay, well, we know this happens in an animal. What if we just look at the stem cells themselves, took them out of things we used, human stem cells, uh, took them from fat, uh, put them in a dish and we can keep them alive forever, you know? And then we put one dish on a ceramic uh, pad, other dish on another one. We repeated all these experiments three times, so they were reproducible. And then what we did is we wounded the stem cells. So I can take like a pipette and just scrape it through and wound these stem cells. And then we did that with the control stem cells and the active. Well, what did we find? Oh my goodness. You'll look and see on the histology, and that's what you'll see, for instance, on the lower aspects uh, here uh, that you can see all these green stem cells that it, they look exactly the same at first, but then the ones that are on the bike and boom, 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 these stem cells sort of came out from nowhere. They migrated into the wound. They didn't replicate. There wasn't an increased activity. We weren't causing cancer or anything where you cause out of control multiplication of cells. The cells didn't multiply. They migrated in, they healed the wound and it was statistically significant it was amazing. So uh, basically, we were excited, of course, and other people were excited. And so our work brought some attention. We were invited to submit it uh, to this major, major symposium that is recognized by our Department of Defense as the premier scientific uh, meeting. It didn't occur last year because of COVID. So people were excited. Our research was reviewed by the scientific community and they accepted, but then they embargo it. The embargo means that we can't talk about it because they only present uh, novel breaking research that affects the warfighter uh, larger. So we're waiting. Sad news is, is that just a couple of days ago, I got the notice that our meeting, uh, which is gonna be in two weeks has been canceled because of the Delta surge. And oh, no. so, yeah, and so, but the reason being is that you've got thousands of physician scientists from around the globe attend this meeting. It was thought to be a super spreader, so for safety. But our uh, research is uh, uh, published on that uh, DOT uh, military uh, site. So you can read it, you can see our poster. Uh, embargo comes off in, in a week or so. And uh, also, it'll be published in its uh, abstract form in military medicine and acute surgical trauma and another publication. So the full publication, uh, people can get that from McCarrick Institute or from PubMed when it comes out, you know, once the embargo is, is lifted. As a consequence of this, uh, we have had so much attention uh, from of course, Veterans Administration and from active military in regards to uh, getting this technology uh, out and tested. So we're doing human studies with wounds, with wound surgeons and, and humans right now. And it really has sort of exploded on us. And uh, I couldn't be happier because this all goes into the component of cells and brain and tissue uh, you know, and I think Carrick Institute learners know that the brain really sets the stage for the autonomic nervous system and vascularization and other things. And that's what we're studying in the, in the short form and long form in regards to, uh, to this research. So in regards to your question, it is complex. We describe it in great detail, as you can imagine, but we've got beautiful pictures, beautiful imaging that shows these steps. And I would suggest that uh, the people that you train could look at the 
histochemistry, could see the picture, see the differences. They're really like black and white, or we'd say green and white, or red and white, or blue and white, and uh, see the difference. Uh, they heal. So we increase the healing, uh, not only in, in the animal. And here's the thing. You imagine the wounds are on the back of the animal, and we healed them, but we didn't put any infrared into the back of the animal because these wavelengths without causing any heat would pass through the animal. It was phenomenal. And you can't do that with lasers and that, you, you know, there's penetrance problems and so, but we went through it, we saw it. Yep. And I'm gonna ask about there. that actually. Okay, um, sure. So we're, let's put here, but let's go back to something else. Cause I, I'm, I'm, I'm bummed about the meeting being canceled but it's probably the responsible choice. I understand it. So we know that the Department of Defense is obviously excited about this work. It, makes sense that they would be. I mean, it's it's amazing, to be honest, just amazing. You summarized the way you did the, the study, the methodology really well. Thank you for that explanation. Let's talk outcomes. If you were going to summarize those, what would you tell us? Well, simply put, the wound healing of the treatment group was significantly faster than the control group of mice. And the wound healing of the mesenchymal stem cells um, in the active group was also increased statistically significantly and associated with significant migration to the wound area. It was incredible. It's never been seen before and never been reported. So we're excited with the double first, you know, in vivo and in vitro. That, that's what we found. Okay, fantastic. Congratulations on that finding. You could do a study and we'll put all that effort into it, but sometimes you don't get that amazing a finding, right? So congratulations. Thank you. Um, another question for you. You talked about lasers. I actually had a question for that. So there's, there's a huge interest in the use of lasers and different types of instruments that'll be used to like stimulate tissues and even brain, right? So the depth of penetrations of some of these instruments becomes, comes into play because they want to like, for example, laser, can we actually get to the cortex? Can we get through the skull? Um, and some people see it as a limiting factor depending on your understanding of the technology. Um, I know that you were trained at Harvard for the use of non-invasive brain stimulation and other modalities. I actually, I think we have some pictures of you doing that stuff. It was pretty cool. What can you tell us about the penetration, the depth of penetration and effect for this technology? And you kind of spoke to it a moment ago, but did you, were you guys able to measure that to some degree at all? Or is it just seen? Well, yes, we measured it. We used uh, one of... Uh, our, our people, one of our professors who's now at uh, the University of Arizona, we actually measured uh, the far field infrared activity from these blankets. And it was right like the, the black box, it was pretty, pretty incredible. The, the penetration of lasers and things, they can go very deep, but they cause heat. So you can use a laser as a scalpel, you can cut with it, it can destroy tissue. You have to be very, very careful. Uh, because it causes heat. Otherwise, if it's safe, it does, doesn't cause heat. It basically doesn't go in as deep. Uh, we know that when we do stimulation of the brain that we can get information through the cortex, but we can't get very deep. And we try to activate areas that will be connected to other areas and uh, onwards and onwards we go. So one of the biggest problems that we see in the clinical literature is the uh, the penetration problems that you know how are you really going to get to the basal ganglia or so can you really do it does it make sense without destroying it i don't think we can with the traditional aspects and there's no sales in here because we have no disclosures and you know uh, we don't we don't sell these uh, these devices if you would so uh, there's no heat generated with this and that means to say you can keep an animal on it for a long period of time. Our animals lived on the mats. Or you can have a person with diabetes um, with a foot ulcer put a mat on their tummy and they can keep it on 24 seven. So uh, there's no heat, but you know, because you've used lasers therapeutically, uh, you've got a very small time window. Can you imagine if somebody put a laser over someone even for like uh, 10 minutes? Or 15 minutes, I, you know, well, we don't do that. They're short. They're short, you know, like 30 seconds, a minute. Uh, and, and there's different sort of uh, formulas. But uh, since there's no heat, you can leave it on forever. And we didn't see any evidence of 
any pathology caused to cells. Like even the stem cells that were living on the mat could do without any problems to the individual uh, cells. And we've seen the same thing with the brain activation in our Parkinson's disease and Alzheimer's disease murine models that I'm so excited to talk to you about when, when we're ready to share uh, that information. So the long and the short, uh, we've never seen anything that might have this penetration uh, safety. Uh, we've had uh, no time limits. We've had animals living on the mats right now for a year with constant radiation without iatrogenesis. So you know, I, uh, I have uh, genetically modified some animals to be Parkinsonian or to have Alzheimer's. And then we breed them. And the, every time you, you have a litter, you know, one out of four is going to be um, a genetic candidate, you know, homozygous uh, candidate for the individual disease. And then we have to see if we can prevent the disease itself. So we have animals just growing up with Alzheimer's and Parkinson's and other animals living on the mats. And so we know what happens over a long period of time and I am excited about it. I'll just leave it like that. Uh, so um, we can't do that with other types of stimulation effects. So there you have it. And this is, it's cheap, right? It's a ceramic so that I think a blanket is, you know, way, way less than a thousand dollars and can be used forever. You know, it doesn't, doesn't run out. There's no subscription. There's no like, that, there's nothing to break if you would. So what do you see for the future in regards to how clinicians may leverage this type of technology? How, how are they gonna use it? Well, I think clinicians are gonna use it to actively in their practices with people that have wounds that don't heal. Uh, we're looking at bacterial counts now and wounds, and we know there's innate responses and other things that are not in this, in this individual study. So people that have surgeries, uh, you know, you have a, a baby, for instance, or C-section or normal deliveries, you're going to want to use this. Uh, you have a replacement of a joint, you have, you know, skin cancer or something, you're going to be using it, or you have a wound. So uh, you, you go to take the frying pan uh, off, the, uh, uh, off the counter and you forgot you just took it out of the oven. You know, people are going to use these themselves. This is sort of like the Band-Aid in the box that I think people are just going to have in their, um, in, in their kitchens and in their first aid boxes. But in the clinical situation with deep wounds, um, I think clinicians are just going to be using it as a, as an easy standalone. Years ago, we used to use hydrocolator pads and you know, or people would use ice and, and now people use lasers. This is pretty well, you know, unattended where, um, you're going to increase healing time. There's just, that's the way it is. Uh, and so I can see people prescribing these, uh, giving to the patient to take them home uh, and having unattended therapies without a problem. And then uh, looking at the consequences of the therapies with the things that you do. So if you increase the healing time and then you do the other sort of things that the individual doctors will do, uh, we expect that the outcomes will be better. Certainly, when we see these animals whipping around having a happy after we've taken big you know, holes out of them um, and the other animals are not too happy, we, we see the same thing with uh, humans. And already we're, we're starting with our human studies to see that. And I won't talk about that part of it yet, but... Um, People are going to be using this. They're going to be and novelly using it. Anytime there's a wound, which means anytime you're, anytime you're injured. Uh, and I know myself, uh, if I twist my back or so, man, I just sit on that thing and it doesn't make a difference. Yeah, it absolutely makes a great, great difference. And, uh, you know, onwards, onwards we go with it. This is, I mean, honestly, it sounds like a, uh... I would say it sounds like the future, but since the technology essentially is simple, it just, it's just exciting. So incredible work. Professor Carrick, what's next? Like, what do you got coming down? Well, as I told you, we're, we're looking at neurodegeneration. We're looking at a brain trauma. 
model blast trauma where we use animals. And uh, we're right now we're looking at human studies. Um, we're very busy meeting with other physicians and research scientists uh, that are aware of what we're doing. And it's exciting. People want to be involved with us. And, you know, when it comes back to our Carrick Institute, our legacy, you know, we've been doing this for decades. And uh, we're now leading the field in this area here in association with, you know, major uh, universities and major scientists. So I think that what's going to happen is that we are going to be in line for some very large uh, grants from uh, government and especially military. We're looking forward to that. We've had meetings already. And I just think we're going to be saving lives with this technology. I can, I can see, you know, people wear body armor, or if you look at a policeman, uh, can you imagine if you have these ceramics embedded in, in a vest or so, and realizing that if you had an injury or you were shot or so, that already you could increase the, the, uh, the healing of that even before you got transported to the hospital. Uh, becomes really great, and especially in situations where there may be a longer transit time. I know you love the outdoors and like to hike in that, but you know, you're climbing a hill and you're out in the boonies. It took you a long time to get there, and you break your leg or you have a compound fracture. Uh, what do you do? What do you do? It could you could be a day or, or two days, or maybe you don't have a cell service to get an air ambulance or something yet, or you're stuck on the side of a cliff, uh, or you're in traffic waiting to go to the doctor's office, you can get something done. So it's really exploded for us. Uh, we're super excited. And I really thank you, Freddie's, for uh, your diligence in, in reading it. And, and I know when you get excited about uh, reading research that other people get excited. You know, you've got that good finger on the, uh, on the pulse. So uh, you'll be hearing more about this individual study as well as our other research that's coming out. Uh, we have a lot of things in the, uh, in the pipeline. I think, boy, by the end of this month, I'll have like 70 uh, papers uh, in the peer reviewed literature indexed on PubMed, uh, which is incredible because basically I'm a, I'm a clinician and we have this, this storm of activities. Uh, one just hit the skids, um, a couple of days ago was our work on looking at exercise in pregnant women. And it was just a very exciting thing. So I think the effect of uh, functional uh, neurology or clinical neurosciences, looking at the entire person and healing has really come around 360. And uh, we're really leading a, a, a very exciting charge in this. Thank you, Professor. It's funny you just mentioned exercise and you know mentioned there an exercise in pregnant women, but what about the future studies with the far infrared uh, ceramic technology and really intense exercise? Because then we're thinking there's another group of people, right? Because technically when they're exercising, that is damage and you rebuild and you rebuild you know stronger and hopefully better and more athletically capable. But I think there's another area that's going to look at this technology and say, hey, I think I need an element of this, right? People are spending thousands of dollars to recover better. And this yeah. may be something they could do easily and inexpensively, right? So this is kind of exciting. So I'm, I'm one of those well, crazy people that probably works out still probably a little too hard for my age. <laughs> no, but exactly what you're saying right now are the phone calls I get each day. Because you're looking at somebody and they go, man, you know, I'm really sore after this and I want to do my legs again, but I got so much lactic acid, da, 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 da. What are you going to do? Well, what's the answer, right? Hydrate, hydrate, you know, this sort of thing, and wait in time. Well, uh, we haven't tested that, but you just poked another idea. That's exactly what's happening because clinicians are calling us and saying, hey, what do you think of this? And I'm saying right now, that's marvelous. Um, we could test that. Well, we can test that. And right now it's conjecture, but um, what a big deal. Can you imagine if you can have a hell of a workout, you get sore, but then the next day you're not sore? Yeah. We don't know. I would expect that we're going to see a difference, but let's test it. Let's find out.
Yeah, that, that'd be amazing because especially as I age, what I notice is my recovery is slower. I still feel very, very physically capable, but the recovery is just slower. So I go, wow, if I could leverage technology like this to recover a little better, maybe move a little better when it, instead of being really sore. And so that's exciting. So Professor, yeah. thank you very much for your time today. This research is incredible. And I'm sure that the Care Suit family is going to be excited to read it and, and more. So thank you very much for your time today. Um, I'm looking more, I'm looking forward to more of the research that your team is coming out with because uh, you are right it looks like these papers are coming up are popping up all the time on PubMed uh, every couple of weeks so congratulations um, for those learners who are re uh, listening to this uh, video at home thank you for sticking around for the whole video hopefully you got value out of it if you'd like a copy of the paper you can reach us reach out to us at the Carrick Institute we'll be happy to provide it or you could uh, eventually it'll be available through all the sources what are the sources that they'll be able to find it on Professor Kerr? Oh, they can get it on PubMed, they can get it on the military sites, uh, they can get it in uh, uh, oh, uh, military medicine, uh, trauma surgery, but I think, I think one stop, care against it, you can direct them to it, or, you know, PubMed, of yep. course. Yeah, we'll update all, all the information we've got. To, so again, Professor Carrick, I know you're a busy, you're, you're a busy guy. Thank you very much for, for your time, and thank you for for doing another piece of research, which has an opportunity to really affect the lives positively for many, many uh, patients through educating our clinicians. So everybody at home, thank you for your time. Professor Carrick, you're the man. Thank you very much. We'll catch everybody next time on another uh, clinical research update. Have a great day. Thank you, Freddie.